job is that I have to add to whatever is there as a picture. I don't be talking about what is on the screen. It's uh, a matter of adding something for the viewers who are back there. And if I can't add something for them, then uh, I always feel the best thing is to say nothing. Silence is your greatest weapon. Which he knew. Less is more. He never said anything unless it was necessary. And a silence from Richard Banner often said a lot more than waffle from other contexts. He was a very concise thinker, and I think that's probably the key to it all. Awful lot of people say what they want to say, but they then can't get out of it. They then say it again in another way, and perhaps the third time. Richard would say it once, and then he would turn off. There were two inimitable stars, in my view, in cricket commentary. There were John Arlen, who was a poet. Well, which he was in that. 153. Father comes in again. Walls and parks. Parks seem so delicate for four. It was a steer more than a cat. Which he was a, a minimalist. Uh, Michael Slater used to be believed. Michael reckons that he once uh, co-commentated over two half-hour periods in his test match. Well, Richie said not a word. But that was Richie, you know, unless there was something to say, don't say it. Richie Bennett was sharper, more pithy, and his observations were all the more powerful for their brevity. When producers put him in front of the camera to introduce the day's play or lead the discussions during breaks for rain, he became something else. BBC cricket correspondent Jonathan Andrew. They were very much my formative years in, in cricket watching the BBC with him and Peter West, Dennis Compton, and Peter Hoker, of course, and all those, all those people, and I would shut myself away for five days with the curtains closed and just watch the test match, and sort of rather live the hours of play, really. You know, so those voices, absolutely, still do, really. Mark Nicholas is the former Hampshire captain, now a commentator and presenter. If I was summing it up, I'd say it was a very great set. Every moment of every day seemed like the most important moment of every day. And at the end of every day, what a day. Or just when you think you've seen it all, and you'd leave with the same smile upon his face with which he'd arrived at the ground. And uh, you always felt that he didn't want to be anywhere else. Soon, though, that salesman for the game found himself in a difficult, even compromising position. In 1977, at the end of a successful Ashes series in England, Cricket was blown apart by one man, a successful, brash and very determined Australian businessman and media tycoon called Kerry Packer. Packer was attempting to set up a super league of the top stars of the game for his own television channel and call it World Series Cricket. Every line wanted a slice of World Series Cricket. It was so different. You had the coloured gear, you had the white ball, the black side screen, microphones at the base of the stump. Is this peaceful scene, our national spirit, endangered by a new threat from overseas? It was a direct attack on the traditionalists that ran the game. Players who took Packers' money were branded mercenaries, traitors, and pirates. It was the language of war. I failed to see that in any way how uh, Mr. Packer, uh, his intervention is welcome to our You know, whether it's welcome to your cricket here or not, there are 35 players to start with who want to be in it. There's more money everywhere in the game. The players were starting to think, well, this is not right. And you had the thing where the 70s became a questioning era in life as in cricket itself. Initially, he was a consultant who, um, who gave Packer advice on how to deal with the authorities. He knew uh, the workings of the Australian Cricket Board, he knew the workings of the um, International Cricket Conference, he knew most of the major personalities that Packer was dealing with. He actually counselled Packer at the early stages to, I think it was make love, not war, was, uh, was one of the expressions in, the, in one of his recommendations because Packer was uh, naturally kind of pugilistic in a public debate. But Benno was enormously credible. He gave uh, World Series Cricket an authority that it couldn't have achieved without him in, in 10 years, I think. Uh, the shouts are there, but the bowler followed on. I was hoping very much that it would be something that would be of assistance to the game, that it would be something new and take it into a new era. 
and uh, I think it can be said that it did that. There are quite a number of people who will be very happy about the variety of things that happened with World Series cricket. Richie was always a, a player's champion. Uh, he was always looking for ways to improve their lot and you need to remember that as a player he made no money out of the game. I think he probably I reiterate what Arthur Morris had said when asked what did you get out of the game and he said poverty. I mean, he thought this was a, about improving their lot because Kerry Packer came along with a bag of money uh, to swing them onto his side. I mean, Richie uh, was a very, very unpopular man in Australia. I was over there at the time of, of what the formation of World Series cricket because people regard him as a traitor. But again, he thought through what Packer was after and he understood that this was in the passport to young cricketers becoming stars in the popular cave for the game. And of the two of them changed the face of cricket. In the years ahead, when Australia ends up the strongest cricket nation in the world, don't say they didn't tell you. Channel 9 will cover the sporting revolution live on twice as many channels ever used before. If you're a sport, don't miss the World Series Cricket Super Test. Cricket 1984 in the summer of 77 online. I think the most exciting thing uh, that has ever happened to me outside the tight test match and the old traffic test was uh, the night in Sydney where um, World Series cricket and Mr Packer threw open the gates rather than closed them and we had 52,000 people in there, the first of the night games in New South Wales and that was uh, one of the most exciting things I've ever known. Hello, welcome to the highlights and welcome to viewers in England, Pakistan, India, West Indies, New Zealand and Sri Lanka. This match is the second semi-final. It's good variation in pace that over from Pasco. He's achieved the breakthrough, 1 to 33. He was prepared to forbear that hostility and he did lose a lot of friends in the in establishment. So I think he described the period as one of making new friends and losing old acquaintances. I must admit, I was a little upset. Just without thinking about it, without putting myself in the position of a professional underpaid cricketer, I thought this is terrible. They're going to ruin all the test matches. Now, certainly, I was in the pen with the batter, and certainly our relationship got not exactly more just is. I probably did a little bit stretched, and I was not, for instance, asked to stay to stay again at um, at, at Bream Street in Coogee. I interviewed Packer at uh, that time, and it was one of the most memorable interviews I've ever done because, you know, he was not an easy man to argue with, Kerry Packer. <laughs> he was falling over. You got the sense he might have fallen on you at one point, he'd kill you. But, but nonetheless, he, he paid tribute to Richie and said that, you know, he, he was his, his really trusted advisor because he had this very clear mind. From the moment he signed on the Golden line with Kerry Packer, he was immensely loyal. I remember him coming here at the Lord's Pavilion. Uh, with a meeting in, in the committee room with the cricket establishment. Benno, very much the establishment figure, came in shoulder to shoulder with Packer and uh, never deviated from that. Much of the success of World Series cricket was down to the way it was presented on television, on Packer's own Channel 9. The colour of clothing, floodlights and white balls made it great evening viewing. When a batsman was out without scoring, a little cartoon graphic of a tearful duck waddled alongside him as he made his way back to the pavilion. Confronting it all, and therefore giving it his approval, was Richie Benno. And played on a very, very good year for that one. A really, that's a good piece of bowling for bowling. He had a voice that was unmistakably Richie Benno. From the moment he said, good morning. Or super shot that, or marvels. And uh, uh, I, I think Richie became embedded in the psyche of every uh, Australian when Billy Birmingham uh, decided to lampoon him. You'd have to say that Billy Birmingham reinforced, if not created, the deity, as it were, of Richie Benno, the voice of the Australian cricket. Well, don't argue with me, please. Can you remember the golden rule we follow around here? We work as a team, and we do it my way. Billy Birmingham made impersonating Richie Benno his life's work. His 12th man records and CDs featured the entire Channel 9 commentary team. Tony Gregg, Bill Laurie, Richie, and Ian Chappell, or Chappelle as he was called. 
but Billy was never entirely sure what Richie made of it all. Here he is talking during a break in play at one of the 2013 Ashes Test Matches in Australia. I've got some lovely uh, letters from Richie from the early days on the embossed they're now an associate's letterhead. Uh, dear Billy, many thanks for sending me the LP. That's how far back we go. The LP, uh, been listening to it in the flat all weekend, and uh, some marvellous sequences and some brilliant production. On the negative side, too much swearing for the sake of it, and a couple of voices still not right. He reckons I couldn't get much of Pelly's voice right or something. But, uh, you know, uh, generally, uh, Richie, I met him at the World Cup in 99, and I never met him person uh, in 16 years and I just heard this oh yeah all right well listen I should be home about seven okay I look forward to seeing you then I thought it's Richie oh that was someone doing me and, uh, and I looked up and there he was and, and I'd never seen him from the waist down for 16 years all I'd seen of Richie was from the waist down you know sitting here walking back to the MCG or wherever he was so I thought I'm going to have to do this god he's put the kids through school I better say good day so, so I jumped up and, and I said Richie, some things you can't put off forever, mate. Billy Birmingham, how are you? And he went, oh, uh, Billy, what a strange place to be seeing you. Uh, and then he was kind of moonwalking away from me while we were talking. He had hold of my hand, but we were kind of on the move while he was talking. Morning, fellas. Morning, fellas. Now, listen up. Mr. Gazinski is going to be here any minute. Uh, Rich, I think you'll find his name is Gadinsky. Gadinsky, is it? Right. Gadinsky. Gadinsky. Then I've stuffed that up. These are my boys, uh, my pussy, I think uh, you probably call them. Yeah, but that'd be pussy, right? Yeah, pussy, of course. That's what I meant. Yes. I don't know for sure, but he did have a gold record of the 12th man, Billy Berman, who had very funny series of CDs in which Richie Benno was imitated mercilessly. He had a gold record of that on, on the wall in his home, Kuji. And uh, when I saw that, I thought, well, he obviously is very happy about being imitated. Two for 22. Two for choo choo choo, if you dare hear film me. That same year, Channel 9 got the Australian cricketers to do their own tribute to their lead commentator. It's an M A R A B E L L O U S, and I'm the king. I'm the king commentator on the number one thing, and I'm a groover too, and a jammer, and that's when I become M C G Hammer, and I feel a solo coming on. <laughs> well, Michael Hussey, you are a talented boy, and, and Rich, I didn't give you a chance to answer whether you like it or not. It's an Australian phenomenon, isn't it? The Australian cricketers do a pretty good impersonation. What are your thoughts? Oh, I think there are some that shouldn't give up their day job. <laughs> That's a very interesting point. Uh, they're on the scoreboard over there. Uh, about 103. A lot of notes out there. It's quite. Oh, I'm, I don't know what they're to say. They've come here. Well, you, <laughs> well, don't don't you worry about a thing. You just keep going. My wife and I need money. <laughs> Thank you. Is that the first time you've met a victim unawares? Um, it's certainly the first time I've met that victim unawares. He would come into the uh, commentary box in the morning and set up his little table in the corner. Jack Bannister, the former Warwickshire player, became a colleague of Richie in the commentary box and a close friend. The, the first thing that he got out wasn't the Wisdom Cricket Annual, it was the uh, Racing Post. And he would study and study and study and he took as much pleasure as uh, that. I know he did because um, we decided to have a, uh, two competitions a year where the, uh, we tried to 
try and pick a winner on a Saturday, wherever we were in the world, in different countries, and uh, the loser would pay a slap of mail for wives and uh, each other. And we did that for 27 years. Uh, we never missed a Saturday. We always had uh, lunch at all the grounds, where we had cooked lunch or sandwiches or everything. And he never, ever ate a single crumb of anything that was on the ground. He always prepared his own sandwiches in his own way. Daphne said he wouldn't even let her do it. And uh, he would walk into the box and there they were. And bang on 1.30 for lunch and bang on uh, 4.10 for tea. He would take something out of his box that he prepared for himself. The thing about Richard, really, was his discipline. And when I did start to present the telly, my biggest fear was, um, was we're sitting under the program looking at the count and he got to say goodbye looking at the camera on zero and I knew I was going to make a mess of it. And the first time I did, with Rich in the box beside me, uh, and he's waited for a moment and he said, that didn't go very well, Jonathan, did it? And I said, no, Richard, I didn't. I said, well, what are we going to do? He said, I don't know, we've got six weeks of this. So he said, well, how long do you need to say goodbye? And I went through it and I said, I reckon I need seven seconds. He said, okay. He said, so when the count starts, uh, you ask me a question, I'll talk to eight. Um, and then it's over to you. So from every night that on in the World Cup, uh, sure enough, he would stop on eight. And I'd look at him and say, well, thank you, Richie. Look straight at the camera. There we go. Great game here today. Well done, Australia, for beating New Zealand. Tomorrow, Richie and I are off to Manchester to watch uh, England against New Zealand. Uh, we'll see you then 10.30 goodbye. Zero. At times, Richie Beddow did feel the need to speak out about the way cricket was going, keen to take part in the debates that have influenced the way the game moves forward. But he was never a buttonholer or a bore, and he wasn't resistant to change. For traditionalists, he sometimes appeared contrary, giving ground to all sides. Gideon Hay. Well, I mean, interestingly, Beno, in his own writings on the game, had frequently been...